Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You guys sound so good today. Thank you, Miss Jennifer, for that uh, for the song, Mr. Magua. Thank you. Indeed, it's a blessing to be here today. This morning, it's always a it's 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 not a privilege. It's a blessing to be alive, to be healthy, and to be strong as we are. Even to this very point that you're here to gather together, it has taken the grace of God, the goodness of God, and the faithfulness of God for us. So we ought to thank him even more and the more and the more. And even as we draw closer to thanksgiving, it's even a reason even to thank, uh, to thank the Lord even the more. But according to me, you know, where I was born... We didn't have a festivity like this one where, you know, we had to come together like uh, next week we'll be doing with our families, with our friends and everything else to give thanks. But uh, the Bible has always instructed us to have uh, that spirit of thanksgiving. We ought to have that. It's not just a seasonal thing, you know, whether they sun or sh- uh, whether they shine or rain, it ought to be in us. That attitude, that spirit ought to be in us of thanksgiving. It does wonders and wonders and wonders. I can testify of that, uh, uh, having been here, having seen the hand of God, even in times of need. And now, may I even say the time of dire need, where you don't see anything, or you don't see the sea parting, you don't see any breakthrough in every way, or you don't see any deliverance. Having that spirit of thanksgiving, where it's just you and the Lord, and the circumstances that are going on and before you or you are going through you know it always does wonders when you remember your God and you uh, and you give him thanks even from that and also acknowledge him because nothing gets God by surprise by the way Nothing will ever get God by surprise. He doesn't hold his chin. He doesn't pace around up his throne, back and forth, back and forth. No, God is sovereign. He knows the end from the beginning, you know, and everything in between. So if we know and we are assured of that, sometimes it's hard to, to know that. We want to see God intervene and we wonder where God is. You know, where, why are we going through this, Lord? Are you, are you still there, Lord? Do you see where I am? It's sometimes it's human to feel that way. But can I say that you don't need to pitch your tent in there and make it permanent and just have that perspective of God, you know, being far away. God is always near. God knows and he understands everything. So we ought to give God thanks. We ought to be thankful all the time because he is good. Now, you know, there are a few things that have been going on, especially with our church and some of our church members that, uh, you know, that are affected probably by, uh, by, uh, by uh, passing on of their loved ones. Some of us are friends, dear friends, by the way. I do not uh, want to uh, uh, not acknowledge that. Uh, that, you know, it's for some of us, we're going through a storm. You know, it's a big storm. But uh, can I encourage you this morning and let you know that, you know, this storm doesn't linger there forever. You know, some storms seem like, you know, they're there to linger and they seem like they're not moving in any way. You know, but I'll tell you this, that every storm has its way and it will move at some point in life, at some point in time. So just hang in there. You know, continue, continue looking up to God. I know it's hard sometimes also, but uh, look to God because he's, the, he's our hope. You know, he's, he's the one that we can trust. He's the one that we can call upon in the day of trouble. It's what the Bible talks about also in the book of Psalm. David learned that so well. He knew that so well. It was inside him so well that he knew his God. And that's why even this young shepherd boy who turned to be a king and the king of Israel uh, after in his wilderness when he was taking care of the sheep and knowing God even in that time when he was by himself alone. A shepherd, by the way, being a shepherd wasn't an easy job back in the day. It was of the lowly of the lowly jobs that you could ever get. You know, sometimes you were not even paid. Sometimes you were just paid even meager. And you would be in the wilderness out there by yourself. But can I say this? When you're caught out up in the wilderness and you're by yourself, learn to keep your focus on God, learn to praise the Lord, learn to, to, to be thankful, like I said, and focus on him because Jesus himself is there with you. 
And I believe that David grew up there when he was alone with his sheep right there. He couldn't speak to them. They could hear his voice, by the way, and this sheep probably, they recognized David. But David knew that it was beyond this sheep that I'll be connecting with. And this is God with me here. And that's why God said that this man is a man after my own heart. He learns to touch the heart of God. And I pray that all of us, even me included, this is a challenge that we will learn to seek after the heart of God. You see, David was defined by God in that way. I wonder what God is defining you this morning when you examine yourself. Because God knows you. You know, we don't know you. Sometimes we can see you and we can see that you're a godly lady or a godly, uh, a godly man. But God ultimately knows you. He knows you. And I wonder this morning what kind of a name he has for you. And if you are born again this morning, can I say that first of all, God looks at you because you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And now you've accepted this perfect gift of Jesus himself being the Lord and Savior. And therefore you have done that, uh, uh, that trade off. Your own righteousness was given to Jesus himself on that cross. And Jesus himself thought, thought it was fit enough to, 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 to give you a righteousness. So now you are called a righteous of God. Because that was that major trade off. Because John 3.16 said it so well that he loved this world so much. And I, I, I believe so. And I'll always believe so that you know, God loved us so much to give us his only begotten son as the ultimate sacrifice. And if we receive him and make him Lord and Savior, can I say that you are made righteous in him. He identifies you as righteous. Now, talking about righteous, we'll be looking at the book of Psalm because also it talks about righteousness, a righteous individual, and also the unrighteous individual. We'll be looking at the, uh, at the two in the next uh, couple of minutes over here. So let's begin by a word of prayer. Let's commit our God. Let's commit our meeting, our, uh, our studies today before God. And uh, if you have something impressed on you to pray about uh, um, uh, your friend or your family, yourself, pray for that. But uh, I will lead us to prayer. And especially remember them uh, that are going through grief even at this time. Uh, uh, um, close to our festivity of Thanksgiving because this is salient for them, for some of us, um, like myself. I lost my dad uh, just a day before Thanksgiving, and I know it's always salient out there, but I have hope that I will see him one day. So it's a reason even for me to thank God even the more because I know where he is and is full of life and living as he can be. So, Pray for them that are going through hardships right now, grief and everything else, and tell and ask God to come and be a comfort, a perfect comfort, because it's only Jesus, it's only God himself who can be uh, that Prince of Peace, and he is the Prince of Peace and Prince of Comfort, that he can come and lean in them and walk with them even in this time. So Lord, we thank you so much for this church, God. Uh, we praise you, Father Lord, for anointing us and calling us, Lord, Father Lord, and uh, uh, just enabling us, Lord, and ordaining us even to be here this morning morning. Lord, it has taken your hand, Father Lord. It has taken your grace, Lord, your faithfulness and your goodness, Lord, for us to assemble even as a class. And so, God, we give you all the praise and glory, Lord. And we just want to say thank you because you've given us the opportunity to be here, Father Lord. Not so many, Lord, would be here, uh, 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 would, would be here, Father, but you saw it fit for us to be here, Father. So, God, we ask that... Um, and you will bless our class, Lord, and you will help us, Lord, even to eat from your table today. I know just uh, physically, but also spiritually, Father, we'll be nourished, Lord. And I ask you that, Lord, even for them that are, are grieving right now, Father, or they are going through uh, different difficulties and challenges, tribulations, Father, they are in a, a valley right now, they're in a storm, Father God, be it big or small. Lord, I ask you that you reach out to them, God, and that, Lord, that peace that you promise, that the the world itself can never offer, Lord. I pray for that peace to come upon their minds and their hearts this day, Lord. And I ask you that, Lord, you'll walk with them. You will comfort them and you'll continue to assure them that, Lord, you're with them even in this time, in this season, oh God. So 
empty me of myself, Lord, in this time, Father God. And I ask you that, Lord, your presence will be with me. That, Lord, what I will utter, it will be entirely and fully from you, God. Just as Jesus said, that the words I speak are not mine. They are from my Father. And so, God, I pray that, Lord, you'll speak even through me to this loved one. So, God, even as we eat from your word today, build us, Lord, even inside and out, oh God. And we ask that this day, Lord, you will be glorified. <coughs> Excuse me. You will be honored, oh God. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1 today. Um, we'll be looking at that. Um, and uh, we'll be seeing, uh, that's the beginning of the book of Psalm, by the way. That's the first chapter. Uh, it's uh, Psalm of David. And if you're there, say Amen. If you're there, say amen with me. Amen. If you're there, I believe that all of us uh, are there. But uh, can I say this, that uh, this psalm right here uh, uh, is written and uh, 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 proclaimed by, um, under the inspiration of God uh, to David. And uh, here he is looking at uh, different things that are going on. Uh, for me today, I just want us to understand where we stand even as righteous individuals and for some, uh, uh, the things that happen to them or happen to them if they live in a world where they do not know King Jesus and uh, they're not being made righteous. So Psalm 1, it's just amazing how things are even to this very point that we are living in um, 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 is that uh, we are seeing things getting even darker and darker. Uh, we are seeing people of faith even being challenged right now. Uh, we are seeing the emergence of what we call walk generation or walk walkism or cancellation. Uh, if you believe one, two, three things that happen to be uh, of faith, by the way, or the truth that you know or that you stand in, uh, these are very prevalent right now, and uh, it calls for us, even as Christians. Uh, to declare where we stand, you know, it used to be sometimes that you know we would we would debate people in public squares and and also in our homes and uh, tell them the reason for our hope and we would share our testimony and and our Jesus even to them and uh, you know they would uh, they would either accept or probably would have some disagreements here but never a time as this where people were. Uh, becoming very intolerant right now, you know, if you bring the truth to them or you challenge them about the things that they are doing or indulging in, uh, that you seem to be the enemy these days. They are very courageous right now. They are very bold even to point at you and say that, you know, that truth or the truth or they call it even uh, the opinion that you have is, uh, is nothing. It's, it belongs to you. So everyone wants to live according to their own truth. And uh, I believe as time goes by, if there is not a revival in this nation or in this world, uh, you know, uh, things will probably even get worse and worse. But even then, as they continue even probably to get darker and darker, uh, that uh, you also need to shine even more and more, especially for us Christians, followers of Jesus. If you have Jesus, then you are the light. We know that Jesus is the true light. The book of John talks about the true light. And if you are the true light then, and you have that light in you, you ought even to shine more and more. You see, when there is darkness, that darkness does not overwhelm the light. It's the presence of the light in the darkness that darkness disappears. And when you come in as a Christian with the truth that you have, and you know and you walk by. That light comes in. And darkness, guess what? It disappears. This is what happens. And so David now, he's talking in, in, in the book of Psalm chapter 1, saying that blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. He's talking about a righteous individual here who really doesn't engage in the things of this world, that his lifestyle, his conversation, his attitude, his thinking, his way of life, his being, 
has been sanctified, has been made righteous in Christ Jesus. This individual uh, who does not involve themselves or has one foot, or they have one uh, themselves in the world and they double deal. Today they're in the church or today they call themselves as Christians, but tomorrow there's something else out there. You can't even tell if they're, if they're Christians or not because they look the same as the world. Those are not true Christians, but a true Christian is someone who has the truth, who keeps on following the truth, who has the Lord and knows the Lord and knows what the Lord requires of them. Is that a person just, just like that? No, he's called blessed. In the, first, in the first verse over there, he's saying, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And then he says that this man, or this individual, or this woman also, is, he says in verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. In other words, he studies. He looks to God. He focuses on God. The things of God makes him delight. Let me ask you this morning, do you delight in the things of God? Do you ask yourself each and every day, almost each and every hour even, that God let my will or let your will align with, with, with uh, let, let my will align with yours? Amen. We can never put God in our program. And most, most of us try to do that. And the world tries to do that. They try to put God in their program. And if you've heard this one, people say that, you know, get with the program and they tell. And they also think that, you know, they can get God to align with their program, fit in their program so that I can be a leader and God can be a follower. God is never a follower of anyone. He takes counsel from no one. God is the ultimate counsel. And so when you align with the supreme, with the almighty God, the creator of all, listen, you will delight. Because in his presence and as you walk with God, then you will flourish in the presence of God. So it says, but he delights in the law of the Lord. Therefore, this man will see himself or herself soaking themselves in the word of God. Let me ask you this morning, do you study the word of God? Do you take time to meditate and think about the word of God and what God is saying for you probably in that minute or in that hour or in that, in that month? Do you delight yourself to know, God, you're speaking to me and I better listen. This life is busy as it is, by the way. And most of the things that we find ourselves, by the way, they are justifiable. You know, you have to attend that to your life. You have to go to work. You have to go home and prepare. If you have kids, you have to make sure that they are fine. And it can take time. Time throughout the It can take your time throughout the day. And by the time you are done, you're so tired, you don't even have that energy or that focus to soak yourself into the word of God. And so you call it a day and you go to sleep. Next morning you wake up, it's the same thing over and over. But have you purposed yourself? Have you made yourself disciplined enough to say that God, probably in the first hour of my day, I don't know how you operate. Some of us are very energetic or we find time in the morning that we can give holy and focused on God, studying the word of God and reading and listening to what God is saying to us. Some of us probably it's in the evenings that we, we have that time now even to focus after we've done everything that there is now to, 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 to sit down and just read and soak in the word of God and, and just even have that quality time with our God. Don't you think that God yearns for us to have that quality time with him? He wants that. He desires that. And that's why I was using the example of David himself being in the wilderness, even as a shepherd by himself with the sheep. The sheep can talk, but he has himself with that musical instrument. David was a good, uh, by the way, he played the instrument, and we say it's an harp, by the way. And can you imagine the songs that he would sing? I would say that if he was a man after God had God's heart, 
then that tells me that he spent his time a lot more focusing on God, delighting in God. And can I say that that can be our lifestyle? It can be our lifestyle. Whether we wake up early, very early in the morning, we prepare our kids, our grandkids, or ourselves even for the day, we, we get ready and, and, and we go on our business throughout the day, that there is a time we can seclude and be disciplined enough, devoted enough to focus on God. And at the end of it, and as you keep on going, then you find yourself what? Delighting in God. Now, let me share this and say this, that, you know, Charles Spurgeon, as his ministry was keep on growing and he was in, on demand a lot, one thing that he noticed is that his prayer life was getting down. I mean, he, didn't, he, he noticed that his prayer life was, was being taken away by the things that he was attending to in the name of ministry. And for us that are in the ministry, sometimes we have to be very careful that these things that, that occur or happen or happen uh, uh, in the midst of us, that uh, we're not so caught up in that, that we forget our time with our God. No matter how justifiable they look, by the way. That Spurgeon says that, you know, even at that time when he found himself even uh, 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 attending to all these needs and, and wants out there, that his prayer life was diminishing. It's always a good thing as a Christian to notice and to examine yourself where you stand with God at the end of the day. And so he has decided, he said that, you know, these things, they found me here and uh, they found me still, uh, uh, go, uh, we, uh, uh, um, uh, can I say, strong with the Lord or focused with the Lord or in link with God. And so therefore, what he decided to do, that every time he would get a break, like a 10 minute break. And I'm sure probably some of you get breaks. Some of you probably even have 30 minutes or 10 minutes, 15 minutes or a whole day, probably majority of it by yourself that you can, you can attend or focus on God. He said for that 10, 15 minutes that I will have as a break for myself, I will be praying to God. And so he started doing that, discipline himself to do that. And he says by the end of the day when he tallied he found out that he was praying even more because in his mind, what he wanted to do was to link up with God and focus on God and stay in communication with God. And when you do that, when you purpose with your mind or with your heart, guess what? It becomes a delight for you. It's not a chore. It shouldn't be even be a chore for you to, 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 to oh, today, oh, at this hour, oh, I got to do, do my thing. Uh, I got to open the word and, and study also, God, uh, lazily enough, you do that, you pray, and lazily enough, you read the word. It should be a delight. If it's a delight, then you know that I'm looking forward to it. And so he says that this righteous man, this blessed man in verse 1, delights in the law of the Lord and in the law that he meditate. In other words, when you read that word and you soak yourself into the presence of God, it doesn't stop there even when you attend your daily business. You keep on thinking about God. Thanking God. That's why I was insisting that we have that spirit in us of thanksgiving. That it doesn't stop this coming, it doesn't just start this coming week, by the way, and stop this coming week when Thanksgiving Day ends or festivity ends. It has to be in you, always continuous. You meditate upon these things, you observe, you think about the Lord. And when you do that, then you delight in the Lord even the more. Notice what it says in verse 3. It says, and he shall be like a tree. Now these are things that will happen to you. Because now what are you doing? You are sowing those seeds of righteousness, delighting in God. You are, you are soaking yourself into the presence of God. And can I say this? When you, is, the principle is simple. If you dip yourself into a swimming pool, you can't tell me that you will come out dry. You'll come out wet. This is the same principle that's applied here. 
You spend time with God, you delight in God. Guess what? The presence of God remains with you. It's with you. And there are the benefits of the kingdom that are following you. This is what the verse we just says. Notice what happens to this righteous man when he, he delights in God and he meditates on God. He says that he shall be, notice in verse 3, it says he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth fruit his fruit that bringeth forth his fruit in his season his leaf shall not wither in other words it will not fade you will always be relevant every season every moment there'll never be a point where you know you're so hard you're very hard for god and then come next season man you are cold you will always remain relevant. And that's why sometimes we see other Christian brothers and sisters. We wonder what keeps them going. Why they have that sense of peace and joy in them. Even when they are going through issues of life. Challenges of life. Trials, tribulations. But yet they are still in one piece. And not many pieces altogether. They are grounded. They are found in the Lord. And if you delight in, your, in the Lord and you remain in the Lord, you will flourish. Does it mean absence of trials and tribulations? No. But in the midst of it all, you're victorious because you know that the Lord is with you. You know that the benefits of God, for sure that he's with you even in the days of shine and in the days of trouble. David knew this. As a young person, he was anointed to be king. But guess what? Even into his ascension as to, uh, to that seat of being a king, he faced many tribulations. He went through life like any one of us and probably even more. He probably could have even had the chance even to give up, by the way. And question the move of God and the will of God and the way of God in his life. For his life, by the way. But he stuck it out. He knew that he was blessed. He was a man after God's own heart. He remained in the Lord. And guess what? He delighted in the Lord and he delighted in his word. Delight in the word, let me say this morning. And guess what? All these other benefits that came with that. It made him flourish. As a shepherd and even as a king. God is there in every stage of your life. Not just being young or, 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 or mature enough. Thinking that you know this is all. Or probably at a certain time this is when I will I'll try and focus on God. I used to have that mentality. I used to have that perspective. It's not true. Whether you're called and chosen and made righteous in the Lord as young as you are or as, as old as you were. I like to use the word mature for the word old. Then you know that every season is open season with the Lord. It's open season to delight in the Lord. And that's what he's calling us to do. So this individual will not, will not go away. This, he'll, he'll benefit he will flourish in his ways. But something else happens here to the individual that's unrighteous, that lives his own way out there, who doesn't have the Lord in his life. That's what we call the unrighteous. Notice one verse 4, it says ungodly. And the ungodly individuals, the verse, verse 4, it says the ungodly are not so. Who are they not so? They're not like the righteous that flourish. They do not delight in the word of God. They do not delight in spending their time with God or in the presence of God. So they live their own way. I want to have, I want to live my life my own way. But if you have the way, Jesus himself, you will live in his way and on his way. And so if you're living an ungodly life, it's opposite of the godly life to them that are called and chosen or have the Lord Jesus in their life. It happens that, you know, in verse 4 it says, the ungodly are not so. 
but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Let me tell you one thing. When I was young enough and used to go visit my grandmother up in the up country, we used to call it country, up country. I know here you call it country, but we used to call it up country. Up country, Jody. Up country, Mr. Magur. And we would drive sometimes for three hours, go to see my, my grandmother to a farm to which she was and my grandfather. And by the way, he died when he was 101. And my grandmother died when he was 96, by the way, just a few months after my grandfather died. But they were, long for, they were married for a long time. And so we used to go and she used, they used to delight seeing us so much. And the place to where they came, there was wheat. Wheat did so well. So they had many acreages of wheat and barley and all this other stuff. And so we used to, they used to, we used to get all this wheat and, and all that and uh, from, straight from the garden used to be harvested. And <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> we would sometimes see when she wanted to make that bread and that lamb stew, by the way, the way she would prepare that wheat, uh, she would take it and go and, and, and be outside when it was kind of windy. All right, she would take this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this flour uh, itself while it was still in a kernel and it had been crushed in the mortar, by the way, and the chaff would still be mixed in there. And so she would take uh, a basket, we used to call it in Swahili, uteo, and she would put all that grain in there, just enough to bake the bread and make bread for us. And she would go outside in the wind and she would throw that wheat up there. And so the wind would come and carry all the chaff out there. It was a beautiful thing to see when the wind comes and you see the wind just go up and then the chaff carried away and then the pure one just remains in the, in the basket. And she would do that, throw it so high and as kids we would delight so much. It's a phenomenal. Guess what? This is what he's talking about. He's saying the ungodly are so, but they are like chaff. Are they in our midst, by the way? They're in our midst. Do they live the life that we live? Yes, they live, but we are different from them. And if it comes to that point where we are to be separated and distinguished between the righteous or the godly and the ungodly, guess what? They go a different route. They live differently. They separate. They're separate from us. Just like this chaff that my grandmother used to throw up in the air. Or this wheat that you, she used to throw up in the air. The fine wheat would just come down to the basket. Then the chaff would just be carried away in the wind. And just, uh, just get lost out there. Now. It says. They are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. You know, you know it's a sad thing that you know the ungodly thing. That you know they have an upper hand. The world right now, you, you, know, you can tell that they think that they have the upper hand when they try to suppress you, when they try to pass all their agendas, their policies, their belief on you, and they want you to believe that. Anything else that comes from you or the truth that comes from you, it's not the truth, it's not relevant. Get to their own program. And they seem like that they, 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 are, they are thriving. It seems like they have the upper hand and they are successful enough. But let me tell you one thing. There is a wind out there that's coming. And everything else that it seems so right that they require the masses to get on that bus or get in that program and just move along with them. It shall be carried away and driven out. Plus themselves if they haven't or they will not accept Jesus and bow to him. And acknowledge him to be the Lord and Savior of their life. It says, therefore, in verse 5, therefore the ungodly shall not stand. That what there says rise in the judgment, no sinners in the congregation or the assembly of the righteous, they cannot be there. Even in the times where we will stand before God, they will not be there. And they cannot even be in your midst because this truth that you receive, this truth that you stand for, you receive it with delight and you take it. It's hope to you. It's what builds you up. It's what keeps you going. To them, this is foolishness, by the way. It will always be foolishness even to that very point when they'll die. If they, are, if they haven't, been come, if they haven't be, uh, been enlightened yet. 
And so it, uh, it says, therefore the ungodly shall not stand, they shall not uh, rise, in other words, in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of their righteous. And verse 6, where this is where it ends, it says, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. God knows. He knows you, first of all, as a righteous individual. He has made you righteous. Remember what I told you, that there was a major trade-off at the cross, by the way. Jesus was made sin. And him that was righteous was made unrighteous and then he gave his righteousness to you. And therefore when you say, Jesus, come, forgive me of my sin. I make you Lord and Savior of my life. And then there's that big trade-off. And now you're made righteous now. And then so the Lord, the Lord says that now he knows you and he knows your way because now you belong. Remember when Jesus said that, you know, to him that the father has given me, none shall be able to be plucked away from my, from my hands. The most amazing thing that can ever happen if all this tribulation and challenges and everything else comes and tries to cancel you, tries to boggle you, tries to press you and suppress you and crush you all the way, if you belong to Jesus himself, none shall be able to pluck you away from his hand because now you are his. You belong to him. And therefore God calls you and he looks at you as righteous, by the way. Yes, it's good to live on this side of heaven. But also when we close our eyes the next second, if you have Lord Jesus in your life, you know that you'll be living in life and in fullness of life because you have life himself and it will be eternal. Where are your investment made this morning, by the way? If you examine yourself, you know yourself more than I do. Only God knows you, uh, knows you and you know yourself. Where do you say you stand before God? Because one day we will stand before God and we will give an account of our life. Where do you stand before God? Are you this blessed man? Or oh, are you this ungodly man over this side? And if you're living for Christ, keep on living for him fully. Sometimes it's hard, by the way. But keep on delighting in the Lord. Stay with the Lord. Even to the last minute. It pays to be in the Lord. It pays to remain in the Lord. Always delight in him. He says, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. It's only just a matter of time that they are wiped away, that they are no longer before you. But even then, it's even a call for us that have seen the light, that have the light that Jesus is Lord and Savior, to pray for them that are not born again. I know a couple of individuals, probably even in my immediate family, that I pray for that don't have, haven't received salvation in the Lord Jesus. I pray for them. Keep on praying for them. Tell them about Jesus. Let them know that you delight in the Lord. And keep on living. Because the Jesus that they will see is you. And they will see you. And when they see a change, because remember, the world will always look. With the minute you say that you're a Christian and a born-again Christian, I like to say that I'm a born-again Christian, they will always look at you. Does his lifestyle reflect what he claims and what he proclaims as the truth? So live for Jesus, live for him, live a godly life. It's never easy, by the way, in this world that you are living in, there is pressure from everywhere. You can all affirm with that, to that. 
But listen, God calls you. God knows you. And he knows that you're still in this world. But the good news is that you are not of this world. He has you. And he cares for you. And he loves you. Keep on walking with God. And as you walk with God, keep on meditating on God. And as you keep on thinking and living for God, live even the more for him. And tell others about him. Because there's a world out there. And believe it or not, there are individuals out there, probably even next to you, that can't wait to be held by their hand and led to the altar and at the feet of Jesus himself. It's amazing if you align yourself with the Lord and ask yourself and ask the Lord, God, what do you want me to do? Can you send them along my way, along my path this day? I'm telling you, something happens. God sends some that somebody who needs to hear the good news just like you heard and you became a born again Christian. There are individuals just waiting. Tell them about God. Let them know that you are blessed by Lord and you delight in the Lord and you are walking with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Shall we pray today as we close? Lord, we thank you so much and uh, we glorify you, Lord, for this time that we've had, Lord, in our study. I pray, Lord, even for this loved one, this day, God, because I know them, God, and I know their testimony. I know that they are born again. So, Lord, I pray that, God, their faith will continue to increase, Lord. You'll continue to sustain their salvation, oh God, and you'll continue even to establish them, Lord, even in your presence. Even in times, Lord, when they feel tired, Lord, that they cannot go on, I pray that, God, you'll continue to refresh them. You'll keep that candle in them, that light in them, keep on burning, Father, Lord, that spark in them. Lord, I pray that, God, it shall emanate and fire, Lord, shall come upon them, that, God, they will feel that they still, and they need to go, Lord, and they keep on, they'll need to keep on going. And so, God, I pray that you'll continue, Lord, even to make them a source of life even to others, a source of light, Lord, even to the dying world, be it their neighbors, be it their friends, their co-workers, uh, their family members, Lord. Father, help them to remain as the light out there. And I pray that, God, you will shine even through them, that even the reason for their hope, God, uh, uh, many will want to know. And, Lord, they will speak about you, Jesus. And they will lead them even to you and point them to you, Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we have and even for the week coming, God, and the next service that we have, Father. And we ask that, Lord, you will be glorified and you will be honored. Keep us safe, Lord, until next time. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say it. Amen. Amen. God bless you.